Hello, my name is Miguel Resendiz. I'm a marketing professional, entrepreneur, and the host of this podcast, Midcast, a program where we discuss how to monetize your talent, ideas, and show examples of people who have successfully done so in the past. In this podcast, we aim to bring the best business and life insights to help you materialize your goals. An open mind will go a long way in this program, so fasten your seatbelts and get ready for the show. Okay, so uh, the first the first question uh, I would like you to, to answer is, uh, who are you and what's your business? Simple question. Um, well, my name is Fernando Ayala. Um, I was born and raised in Ensenada, Baja California, Mexico, Mexico. Um, f- a small fishing town, a very humble town. My family was born and raised in, in, in Guadalajara City. Well, my dad in Arandas, the highlands of Jalisco, and, and my mom, she's a, a Guadalajara citizen. Uh, and well, uh, then I moved uh, se- several years ago when I met you, remember? Mm-hmm. Several years ago, uh, 12 years ago, or so I don't even remember, bro, right? Like 12, was, 13 well, years. I was, four, I was 13 or 14, and you, yeah, 13. And then you you moved in, yeah, basically 12 years ago. Yeah, you you were uh, you were in puberty, man. Yeah, you were like yeah. not even a teenager, right? remember. I was beginning to be a teenager. <laughs> Almost, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, you were a child almost to me. But, uh, you were a child to me, honestly. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but it was it was great to meet you. Like when we we stay, I mean, we remain uh, friends. So mm-hmm. to not make this too long, uh, I grew up in the border of the country, very mixed culture between the Americanized uh, side and, and 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 the Mexican culture. A uh, very strange uh, mix in in the border towns, and then I moved to Guadalajara uh, over a decade ago, uh, uh, just looking for opportunities. Finished high school, looking to study, looking for jobs. Uh, I started to work at that. That I don't even remember. Fourteen years old, fifteen years old, um, uh, very young. So I was I was used to it, and and then. Uh, I started here my my studies in sociology, so I, I have a sociology degree. Um, uh, I have specialized in, in in culture cultural studies. We call them uh, everything related, especially to to society in in social sciences. And uh, as you mentioned uh, before the recording, uh, I was working in a hostel. I started to work in a hostel around 2011, uh, and I got involved in in tourism. In, in, in the touristic industry here in Guadalajara. And in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, 2000, mm-hmm. the idea came before, but I think we we got the website and the platform in, in, in 2018. Uh, we found it, uh, me and another colleague, another- oh, Your colleague was Mike, right? One of your coworkers, right? He was actually my boss. I was working for him, but my other colleague, uh, I, I, I do keep him. He's another local guy with a lot of experience in tourism. Uh, mm-hmm. He's David, David Arce. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so he remained together uh, in a very, we will talk about it because this podcast I know is about business, but we will talk about it, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, in a very different system uh, of working. We, we work, uh, he and I, so 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 yes, uh, he's my partner. But uh, in terms of business, it's very very rare what we do. We we normally are independent. He has another business too. I have another job too. So we will talk about it maybe in a, in later in the podcast. And uh, we founded this tour agency, David and I, the tour agency for uh, experiences. In this case, small group. Uh, uh, touristic activities. We're talking about uh, guided tours and tastings, mm-hmm. and um, and that's what we do here in Guadalajara City and, and surroundings, right? Because we have uh, several destinations here in, in Jalisco. Do you do tastings of tequila, right? Or do you do tastings of any of, other? Uh, see, tastings of agave spirits. So we include there mezcal and tequila. 
Mm -hmm. and, and I do tastings of craft beer, local craft beer with local producers, of course. Okay, cool. And how, do you do you think a lot of Canadians go to, to your tours or is it mainly Americans? A few. A few mainly Americans. The tourism, especially international tourism in, in Guadalajara, uh, over 60%, uh, I would say they're Americans, United States people. So I, I can hear you, the bells from the temple. So would you mind explaining what that means to the people in here? Because he, this is not really common in, in Canada. So um, would, you, would you like to explain what, those, what, what the bells mean? Sure, sure, bro. Uh, very interesting, right? Uh, my, my true passion, I was talking to you, uh, I was talking about me, right? Uh, about my history a little bit. Mm -hmm. But my true passion is, is history uh, and, 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 and culture and art, especially Mexican, of course, Mexican mm -hmm. history. So, so that's part of us. The religion in Mexico has been very important since, since the conquest. We have been conquered by the Spaniards, as you remember. So the religion, in this case, Catholic Church, was imposed. Mm -hmm. by the crown, by the Spaniards, and it became, obviously, through centuries, it became a strong tradition, even for us, right? We are Catholic, our families, mm -hmm. our relatives are, are, are Catholic. Uh, we know each other very well, you know, or, or siblings. Or so it's a, it's a tradition, and every Sunday, um, before, it used to be every day, uh, 40 years ago, right? But uh, but uh, on, especially on Sundays, they ring these bells like they did 300 years ago to, to call the people to the ceremony. Yes, pretty much to, to let the people know. Uh, in, 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 this case, in this case, very, very old fashioned style of calling the people in. Today you have you have these technologies, Facebook events and that stuff. But it's a tradition, yeah, it's a tradition. And for the people that is hanging over today, it's not great, honestly. So one, one of the very important things about uh, this tradition in particular is that it is also a patriotic symbol, right? Because that's how the independence got started. You know, uh, that's how Miguel oh, is- Oh, yes, yeah. I mean, we had wars with, with, with religion. We had the Cristera in 1926. We had in the independence, uh, the big fight between the church and then and, and the liberals, of course, the mm -hmm. people that rebel against the crown. So, so it has been there forever, or even with the uh, Guerra de Reforma, Benito Juarez uh, removed a lot of uh, benefits from the church and, and there was a civil war. So yes, man, yes, for sure. That's things forever. That's for history. Yeah. So like I, uh, I just uh, took the opportunity to to illustrate uh, people about, you know, like- Yes, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong for the for, for your audience or for the people listening. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not against it. I'm just telling you the facts. I mean, yeah. uh, it's an institution. It is mainly an institution in, in Mexico. It seems forever. For so, sure. so what's the name of your business, uh, Fernando? Sorry, come again? What, what's your business? your business's name? It's called Jalisco Trip Experiences, Jalisco Trip Tours. Uh, it's it's tricky though, right? Because in social networks you use one name uh, in order uh, uh, to make it easier for the people to find you. But uh, but it's mainly Jalisco Trip, the name. Uh, and and yes, we're talking about tours and tastings. So what's the best way for people to to visit your your business's website, what's the link? Or do you have like a, an easy way for them to contact you? Uh, they can contact me through social networks. So you can find us uh, at uh, Facebook, uh, Jalisco Trip Tours. And I think on Instagram is just uh, at Jalisco Trip. Uh, it's a little bit quicker. And also the website, uh, JaliscoTrip.com. JaliscoTrip.com. Okay, so first of all, um, now that you have introduced yourself and a little bit of the, of the culture in Mexico and what your services are, uh, now I would like you to, to kind of expand a little bit on what were the first challenges um, that you faced when uh, starting your startup and, and was Mexico uh, or like Guadalajara in this case, um, 
you know, like a, a good place to start it or would you start it in a different place if you were to start it again? It's a great question, man. It is a great question. I think it's great. Well, La was, was great because when I started, many of the experiences that I, uh, uh, the experiences that I, that I begin, begin with, uh, the first ones uh, were not available, were unique. Mm -hmm. Some of them uh, remain like that. For example, I don't know anyone else doing craft beer tours in Guadalajara for tastings, mm -hmm. and I do them. Uh, in terms of the market, I discover the market thanks to the hostel. In my mind, as a Mexican person, I never thought there was people coming from all over the world to Mexico. I never seen that before. I used to be a worker and a student, and a, and a student. so. 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. high school. Uh, that's when I started to, to work. And then 12, 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. job uh, in, in a liquor store, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, well, grocery store, in, you know, in Mexico, it's abarrotes. They, they sell a little bit of everything. It's like a convenience store. Convenience store, like a Mexican 7-Eleven, if you can put it that way. Yeah. Um, so I started to work early, and, and I think it's part of that. You just start to know how it works, especially the basics of a business. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to supply a, a good, uh, in my case, a good service. Uh, in, 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 in other cases, a good, uh, good products, right? Uh, uh, so at the end, uh, the reason I started to do this, and I liked it and I enjoy it, is because I was doing it for free, man. I mm -hmm. was doing it for free for for the friends that I made in the hostel. Like like people was asking me to me uh, was asking to me the the you know uh, do you know the uh, area? Do you, what do you recommend? Uh, the local stuff. And when I had the chance, like you know, in, in the hostel, I, I used to work uh, from nine a.m. to three p.m. and then I go to university. 4 p.m. to 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 8 9 p.m. depending on the on the the teacher. So sometimes in the weekends or even when I was uh, well, public universities they don't care a lot if if you show up or not. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I was tired of of the of the of the everyday life, I just uh, hang out with these people like uh, Fridays, Thursday. Like, do you want to go to a cantina? Do you want do you want me to show you around the historic center, the real stuff? Because honestly, most of the history of Mexico that I learned, especially the, the real one, I learned it at the university. Because when you're a kid, they just tell you whatever, especially it's very violent. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's very violent or, or, or history. So it makes sense. People get radical about it. I don't think I want to be that radical. But the truth is they hide the, the coups, they hide the, tre they hide the treasons, they hide the torture. They hide, they hide everything for the kids. Well, uh, I, think, I think they do, they, they don't hide it, they just omit it. Because we know- Omit it, omit it, omit it. Yeah, because we know kind of the direction where it took. And obviously um, I, I, I understand that in, in university you, you see like the bigger picture and then you can possibly uh, understand it better. As a kid, they usually, tell you the key points, you know, like who are the main heroes and what happened. And, and they use, I think they use it as a, as a method to create patriotism towards Mexico. And I think all countries do that in a way. Um, um, yes. Yeah. I so bet. I bet. That's the only way to keep people kind of, you know, united in, in some way, I guess, uh, or at least that's probably the way they try to do it. Um, nationalism. That's what it is, bro. Nationalism. Yeah, would well, you think there is a big difference between nationalism and patriotism? Yes, I think nationalism is is when the government imposes it with all the resources, like happened in Mexico after the revolution. Mm -hmm. If when you become more democratic, I would say it's is it's a good question. It's hard to answer that one. In terms of ideology, I would say the ideology becomes subjective at the end, it, 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 at the end is perception uh, of your knowledge and, and, and the background that you have, but they're very similar because if, what does it mean that? 
you just mentioned it, mm -hmm. unites the people, unites the crowds, mm -hmm. especially against other countries, and gives you that sense of identity. So mm -hmm. that's the most important to me. It gives you that identity that you belong to a group called, in this case, a country, Mexicans. In your case, Canada, you're a Canadian, so you belong. It makes you that, it, it makes you belong pretty much. So yeah. it's not something, it's not something big or it's not something uh, uh, like, it, it is a substantial thing, I would say, to, to unite the countries, like you mentioned. Yeah. But, uh, but patriotism, uh, I think, in terms of history, is more developed by the United States. Again, using all the resources, even movies, right? Hollywood. Yeah. So, so at the end, uh, you hear the speech, for example, of, of the former president. Uh, well, he still is, right? Uh, this guy, Trump. Yeah. Uh, and you can hear it in the speech, in the in the meaning that that he's saying we're we're better or or or, or we should be better or we should be the greatest, etc. Right. So I think it's part of that. Uh, when you exaggerate it, mm -hmm. that's that's when the problem uh, becomes and 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 I mean it starts. But yeah. going back to your question, because I don't want to deviate from yeah. from 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 the from the question. I started because I did it for fun. I enjoy it. I wanted to pra practice my English. And yeah. you realize, especially after uh, one and a half years uh, of, of history that I had in, in, in the university, um, almost a half of the, of, of the, of the career, right? Yeah. Uh, you learn the real history and a lot of facts. And I knew, because I'm Mexican and I know the people around me, Mm -hmm. I knew that people doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. People, people uh, it's very difficult for people to, to know those facts. You need to study a lot, which I did. Yeah. And, and no average Mexican does that in history because history is not giving you money. Yeah, sure. So, so at the end, you don't need to. You don't need to. It's, it's again, it's a, a supply and demand, right? Yeah. So that's the reason I started to do this also. Because my passion is history. My passion is hanging out with people. Mm -hmm. And I do enjoy drinking, of course. I'm a drinker. So okay. so at the end, how can I make my passion a business? The only thing that I found it, it was this business. My experiences or my tours. Because you offer, you share the knowledge that you have to, or in this case, foreign people, mostly internationals. They mm -hmm. pay you something, right? So yeah. that's yeah. the reason I started, but because some of them also mentioned that, that I should do it. Like, like Fernando, you're really good. You know a lot of history. You know a lot of this. Uh, you should do it. I'm like, I never knew that people actually paid, uh, in some cases, a lot of money for tours, right? Especially Americans. So sure. then I discovered our market. I researched, of course. We have technologies, very easy to do the research, it's called Google, mm -hmm. your research, and then you find out the scarcity because mm -hmm. the volume in, you need to know basic economics, of course. Mm -hmm. If you don't know basic economics, you cannot do any business and you don't need a school for that. We were talking also be, before the recording. We don't need, uh, you don't need any education. You can educate yourself. That's what I did a lot and, and I keep doing, but, mm -hmm. uh, but understanding that uh, there are markets, groups of people willing to pay for your service and, uh, and, 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 and to understand them and to provide something valuable, something important for them, something that they will be, they will be willing to pay for. So, um, sorry for interrupting. You can keep going. No, no, no problem. No problem. Uh, and so just to finish that idea or, or, or that, uh, um, yeah, that fact. Um, so, when when you discover this market, you tell you can tell that especially high end tours and mm -hmm. and, and 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 unique experiences they're not available. So for me, it it it, it then become become like a, a certainty for me that I should do this. You know, it's like people is not offering. I would do it because I am a demanding customer in general for any product or service that I consume. So I know that I would do it. Uh, and I look something good, with good quality. Uh, and I can tell uh, because of the research research that I did, I can tell that there's not many options, maybe a few, 
but then you have the problems of Mexico of availability, you have the issues of Mexico of impunctuality, you have the issues in Mexico about uh, uh, the, the, the local guys treating the customer rude because it's in our culture, you know? So, so, so then you, you realize you have to be different than the competitors. That's my point. You have to be different. You have to offer a great product or a great service. And you need to find that market or to discover that market that is willing to pay for it. That's, that's, that's what I find out. And then I said, okay, I'm going to invest. And, 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 and then, it, 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 then with, that's the part of the money. You, you need also to invest, right? Okay. So this, this point was pretty, pretty good. And it actually allowed me, um, allowed me to kind of imagine what it, was, uh, what it was like to kind of create your business. And it probably seems pretty risky. Going back a little bit to to when you said that um, you didn't require any education to understand basic econ or economics, um, I will I will argue that you were pretty educated about economics already, right? Because you, you and also at school, you're right. I I learned a lot of, uh, at school. Yes, yeah, you're right. Because you, I remember when we were to when we went to to university. I mean, I used to go to your classes just to see and oh yes man i remember that that, that, that you were killing it yes yeah <laughs> i was just curious about what, what was happening and i remember that famous poem uh, the salvia salvia maldita you remember that poem oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, these these teachers uh, some of them are very poetic yeah, very into philosophy and it's not even the subject of the class and, and, and you you just show up and and and, and realize about it <laughs> yeah yeah I man that was funny exactly i don't remember maybe you remember better but i remember the the poem and and you were very interested yes yeah like there was this guy who i mean it, it was a class man and the the professor asked i think everybody to to recite a poem and amongst the classmates there was this famous poet poet, poet that um i don't know man he was just famous like apparently and and i remember he was like Salvia maldita, and like you know, he was so so fucking, um, just just so fucking emotional about it, man. And okay. and like you and I were like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> <laughs> I have never been, I have never been so shocked by a poem, man. <laughs> no, man, you wouldn't believe it. I, I also had uh, lessons in in the psychology. Uh, a school uh, in a private school remember uh, Kudem, close yeah. to our neighborhood and yeah. i had also a few teachers like that man uh, two, two of them um mm -hmm. so they they influenced me a lot and they, they they create that emotion yeah exactly they create those emotions for you to feel and and and, and maybe that's like a technique for them to to open your mind maybe we don't know but yeah those guys are very sharp yeah. And I remember I, I got into history because one of my teachers too, they're in the psychology school. I only stayed there for, 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 for two semesters. I studied one year uh, psychology and then I left, moved forward to sociology. Mm -hmm. But um, but, uh, but yes, he also, um, he asked uh, us obviously to, to get a book for the class for that semester. So we got the book. And, and and it and, and it was uh, I have it right here. It's actually uh, what is the history? That's the name. Es la historia. What is the history? The author is Edward H. Carr. Edward H. Carr, and he talks uh, the whole book. Uh, he talks about history in a very poetic way, like 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 it, like if you're talking like something super important, and then stories about. There's a history about an elephant, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. So I think uh, emotions are important to, to make you uh, open your, your, your perspective, uh, I would say, because I have seen that in my tours. Mm -hmm. And people say at the end, like, Fernando, like, what you just shared to us, we, we will never learn that in another place. Find out about this in, in, in another tour or in another... So, so it was impressive, or, or or even just the history. I'm not creating the, the information. I'm just sharing you what it is. But mm -hmm. because it's so uh, hidden, uh, even for us, for for Mexicans, mm -hmm. uh, when you share that and the relationship, 
the, the relationship between the American history and the, in the Mexican history that I love that subject subject a lot. Not very touch in Mexico, but uh, they're like not many Americans know that there was a war between United States and Mexico, and that and then we actually lost in eighteen forty eight. Um, so so. Well, I think you know it's like many know, many facts that are very interesting. You know. Yeah, the fact that they, I think that the the thing that Mexicans and Americans don't know because they know about the Mexican American War. Um, it's actually famous. And they and the thing that they don't know is that they were actually losing the war. Uh, and the reason why they ended up winning was because the vice president of Mexico ended up betraying the Mexican president so that he could take up uh, take over the presidency. Oh yes, there was a lot of treason, and that's not mentioned either. Yes, yes, yes. there was a lot of facts because the the Mexican war, the Mexican American War, was vastly dominated by the by the Mexican army because I mean. If you compare the Mexican army at the time, it was huge, man. And then it was mostly men from uh, it was mostly men from from the farms, right? And I have I have met both, you know, like um, Anglo-Saxons, and I have met native Mexicans, <laughs> and I can tell you, Anglo-Saxons are huge and big, but Mex native Mexicans are very strong, man. Very strong. Oh, yes, I understand. I mean. You have to, there are many facts in ball. I mean, we cannot reduce the, the war like that in a few words, but I would say that in the history also is part of it. I mean, the historical journey, they knew we were uh, tired of several civil wars, the French invasion before, the Guerra de Reforma before, no money to invest in, in another military or weapons or munitions. So they knew the timing. I mean, that's the reason they did it. The 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 president uh, Falk, if I don't remember honestly, but that's the reason they did it. They took it. I mean, Americans are very smart. They take opportunities. They're great doing that. So they knew we had civil wars before, uh, instability in a political uh, sphere, and 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 they always wanted their country. So let's take advantage of that. The reason, I mean, they beat us anyways after several years. But the reason they left it, it because it be, the truth is it becomes also economic. Uh, the civil war started uh, in United States, and uh, there was no technology, man. There was no bombs, no drones. It was by food. It's it's super expensive to maintain two wars in two countries simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, simultaneous. That's the reason they left Mexico City. That's the reason the American army left Mexi Mexico City because they had to leave. I mean, there's no money to do that, not back then. So, mm -hmm. so that's the reason that they left. This would be America if, if, if they, that didn't happen. Uh, yeah. So they had to go back and, 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 and fight themselves right in their country. Uh, so, so there are many facts involved for sure. But going back to the business part, I would say that uh, when you can tell that that information is not being shared, Mm -hmm. And you think it's important, especially myself as a researcher, I believe it. So in terms of the emotions that we were talking, you share that. And I think that's the best thing to do to involve people in a tour and also to, to give them that joy, that feeling, that sensation uh, that, uh, you, that you don't need to do something like, I see it all the time, like promotions, 50% discount, um, uh, they give free gifts, free shots, whatever. And in my opinion, when you do a great experience and obviously you find your niche, people that is interested in listening, of course, uh, in order to, to involve the people and, and, and give them that feeling of, I just had a great experience. This guy is super knowledgeable. My pronunciation is just sucking. It's Sunday, man. Knowledgeable. Um, <laughs> so, so all, all the at the end, of, all the comments that they do at the end, uh, telling you that you're great, especially because we know the people that work with us are super uh, informed and, and super trained mm -hmm. uh, about the subjects. Um, so, at the end, uh, that's going to be the review. That's going to be the recommendation. And I see people making mistakes, mistake, uh, mistakes. Uh, a lot of them in uh, honestly lowering, lowering or 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 or, or marketing price, 
Um, there's many ways to, to do business. I think if we united better, uh, it would be a different thing, but very different history in Mexico. There's no unions. Uh, it's, I mean, very difficult to get a, a support from the institutions or the government. You were talking about Canada, that they get a lot of support. We don't get that here, for example. Uh, we have pretty much everything against us. And if you realize that, you take the risk. Because when you meet people from all over the world, I met people from, you know, countries like I cannot even pronounce. And obviously, we talk about subjects that are interested. In many cases, business and economics. So that's the reason you learn, uh, too. You have to listen. You have to interact with people. Uh, not only books or, 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 or YouTube or podcasts like this one. I mean, you, you have to make it an everyday job, you know, learning, especially in terms of business, right? You know that better than me. So, so at the end, uh, uh, I, I would say that um, even with that, we have amazing entrepreneurs in Mexico. We have, uh, the, the, in many ways, some of the richest people of the world is Mexican. Uh, I mean, it's not an apology of the richness, but if you know how to deal in that system, in this case, your country, or when you are international, obviously these corporations have international, uh, 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 how do I say that, uh, reach, you know, um, you have to be super smart to do that. And you have to know your market very well. And, 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 and obviously, that political economical system is gonna fight you back, especially when you're an entrepreneur, super small, no budget. You have to move, it's like a puzzle, and you have to move through the puzzle, find out the gates, find out the doors, open the doors, push them, because in Mexico it's like that, it's like the jungle. Uh, in many ways, politic, uh, political issues affect us. Right now, the president is doing everything very well, very strict. And as a businessman, honestly, I would prefer the last government uh, <laughs> where they where they don't care and the corruption is happening and, and tax avoidance. And uh, in, in, in terms of the incomes, I would say, oh, my goodness, right now I have to deal with the, uh, how do you say, Hacienda? The, with the, yeah, the tax collection uh, agency of Mexico. The fiscal, uh, yeah, exactly. I have to deal with that uh, because right now, guess what? The government is becoming... Uh, incorrupted or or or, or is, is doing the things right, right? Well, so, they're doing the things right in the in the places where it matters, I think, and because obviously I think um, they they have decided to to really focus on on the fiscal um, policy and get and basically help most people get into the formal economy. Because one of the one of the main uh, things that maybe you can touch on uh, in a little bit is how prevalent the informal economy in Mexico is and, and also how that negatively affects the country. Because our GDP is very difficult to measure, especially since most people don't pay taxes, right? And, and there is really no way for us to, to track the transactions between these small businesses or that these small businesses uh, receive. Because I think one of the main, one of the things that really make the Mexican people uh, special is that Mexican people are by nature entrepreneurs. Most people have a have a little side hustle uh, that that provides for their family. Because to be honest, nobody nobody can live with this with the salaries that are provided by normal companies in Mexico. I mean, even you when you know you remember when when you used to sell uh, movies uh, at the market. And I, I was there helping you sell the movies. So yes, I remember, man. That was a side hustle, man. That's something you did on on Sundays, and 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 like that that market, man, had at least at least ten thousand uh, vendors, and those ten thousand vendors, man, had formal jobs from Monday to Saturday, and then on Sunday they did their side hustle. I think that's uh, that's something that in the past it looked it looks really beautiful and convenient for the country but in at the same time it really it really brings down the ability for the of the government to to improve our infrastructure and also help us provide um, social services because because 
they don't they don't really collect taxes from them. And as well, I think Mexicans don't really like um, the government collecting taxes because we know where those taxes actually go to. They go to the government's um, pockets. Yeah, pockets. <laughs> So, so pockets. We, don't really trust, we don't really trust the government, right? And we don't really trust that they are going to provide for the people that need it the most or for the people that just need it, right? Because I think, um, how many, you probably know this much better than me, um, how many people are in the poverty line in Mexico, below the poverty line in Mexico? It's a good question because the pandemic, um, yeah, I took, uh, I mean, I, I took a statistics, uh, Three years I had a, a statistics. I hate the statistics. Um, I don't think you can predict because you just mentioned many uh, uh, related information about that. I don't think you can predict it, not even in your countries. I mean, developed countries. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very hard to do that. We don't have the technology to do that. Maybe 20 years from now. But um, like to, to measure every business, everyone, every house, how many persons, how much do you spend? For sure not in Mexico, it's not possible. But yes, you have uh, standards. Let's put it that way, right? You have standards. Mm -hmm. I would say 45%, almost the half percent works in informality and the rest is, is formal jobs. So okay, half, yes, I would say half. People remains working in, in, in informal, mm -hmm. and the other half in in like like regulated jobs, right? Um, the, through these, we have also outsourcing. the the low uh, the, the, the 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 wage the weekly or 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 normally we have quincena every fifteen days people get paid um, is very low, is around. 2,500 pesos, 3,000 pesos every 15 days. Uh, so monthly, that would be 15, sorry, 15, uh, uh, 5,000 to 6,000 uh, pesos monthly uh, for a standard worker in a regular job. Uh, we're not talking about a specialized jobs. A specialized jobs are, I would say, not even the 10% of the population, like engineers, doctors, et cetera, right? So those jobs, in my opinion, they're also doing bad because I do have friends doing those jobs. So they're also doing bad, uh, but uh, compared to countries like yours. But uh, well, the truth is uh, they have better opportunities uh, to, to, leave, to learn English and, and, and leave the country. That's, that's what the people that is really smart and studied six, eight years, right, a doctor or something like that, they just leave, uh, get the master, get the English certificate and, and find better opportunities. But uh, in our country, yes, the opportunities are very little in general for business. There, there is corruption also. If you want to get licenses, if you want to get paperwork done, uh, you will, ma you, you, you will, I mean, you might do the process, like the process, the application, but in order to get the, for example, support from the government, in order to get it approved or something, it maybe never happened, right? Uh, so obviously, meanwhile, you need you need to run your business. So that's that's the point. They don't care. Politicians don't care. Institution institutions are very likely to to help the the citizens. So uh, very not likely. So at the end, uh, you have to do it on your own. But if you notice exactly because the situation forced you, I would say I was forced. I don't want to be working at 66 like my father is doing, selling tacos on the street, you know, because I'm poor, because I never got uh, something better. So at the end, uh, at the end, uh, I want to retire at around 40, 45. Hopefully someone else will run my business, right? Uh, and and that's, that's another huge podcast that we can make, man. And what is the purpose in life? Because in my opinion, if you ask me, in my vision is like, since I was a kid, I, you know, I like I like art, I, I like drawing, I like history, I like reading books, I like doing sports, uh, but there are very little opportunities in order to make money or make make it for a living doing that. 
you may become an athlete, but when I realized I was I was already like 16, 17, that's already old, old to become a professional athlete. So that would be fun. Honestly, I would love that, you know, uh, and you can make you can make good money. You can make good living if you become a professional player, uh, like here in Mexico, soccer player or whatever. But uh, otherwise, for example, I love philosophy. Uh, I love also, again, history, politics too. Very long history of politics. I never had the chance to read it uh, all uh, because I'm busy working, doing other things, exactly. Uh, so at the end, that's another subject. But I wanted to figure out a way to do something that I like, to do uh, something that I love uh, and, 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 and make it a living. So that's, that's the reason I started too. And I took the risk because of that, because if I make it uh, so I can retire at least earlier than a regular job right now, they actually uh, went higher on the age, this government. I think it used to be 65 to be uh, retired. And right now is, I think, 68 or 70. So just imagine how long I have to work in a company uh, to, to be pensionado, right? To get the pension from the government. It's like all my life. And that's, gonna, that's going to mean no traveling, no fun, Monday to Saturday, eight hours every day. Uh, and then when you, when you are adult, 68-year-old, you're going to get... 30% of that every month. So how do I survive when I'm old? You cannot. It is not possible. That's, a, that's what I mean when I say, uh, or institutions, they don't care that much. Be because if you understand these subjects that we're, that we are talking right now, we're discussing right now these subjects, it's just pretty clear. I mean, if they, if they would care, I mean, or wages would be triple or something, you know? Uh, but at the end, they don't care because going back to the history, since forever, we have been the cheap labor for many countries. At the beginning for Spain, today for many other countries, United States, even Canada, we have the NAFTA, right? So, so at the end, we are cheap labor. And, and that's the way they see it in a... In a a macroeconomical way, you know, in the structural way, you know, uh, I'm talking about uh, geopolitics, you know, geopolitical. So, so that's the way they see it. That's the reason we have been friends of the United States government since, since forever. I mean, they don't want competitors. Look, look what's look what's happening with China, because they became the real competitor. Yeah. So, but but the truth is, they don't want competitors, especially neighbors, right? Especially your neighbors. So one, one thing that, I mean, you mentioned is that the government of, of Mexico or like the, just the Mexican system is basically like a jungle that's fighting against you to progress. And um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. It came naturally. <laughs> so it is kind of a little bit of uh, a little bit counterintuitive that that's happening because you know, like the, the goal of any country is that their economy is boosted, right? They want to boost their economy so that um, not only not only the, the rich people do well, but also that the middle class exists that can balance basically the ecosystem of, of the country, right? Because a country with a healthy middle class, I think, um, helps the country have a really good um, social economical kind of like uh, stance. And what I'm what I'm seeing right now is that it, it almost looks like um, there is a a crab mentality in Mexico, and what I don't what I mean by crab is like the animal from the sea, right? Not crab like poop. Uh, I mean like there's this crab mentality that as and that, that's something in Mexico we talk about a lot that uh, the the worst enemy of a Mexican is another Mexican, and and basically there. <laughs> There is a there there is uh, the analogy of a crab of like a bucket of crabs, and how when one of the crabs tries to go up uh, on top, um, the remaining of the crabs will pull you down to get you at the same level as you were before and at the same level that they are at the moment. And do you do you really believe so? I don't believe it. I don't I, believe it. I don't, I, I don't think so. I, I 
I don't think so. And I, I think it just depends on where you are. Um, right. Let me, be, let me, let me be clear. It's a decision to believe it. I'm not saying that is happening. That happens. It's called competition competitors. Yes. But then it, yeah. but then it happens sometimes in a way. It's, that... it's the logic. You don't have to be emotional. I, I, I don't think that way in, in business. I, I think it's the logic of the system. The logic of the system, capitalism, is to compete. And in order to compete, they will do whatever they need. But the it's, world... it's the logic of the war. Just, just, just think about it. It's, it's the same logic of the war. It's mm -hmm. to destroy your enemy. It's the same. I use that analogy because I love it. They will use the, the, the strategies. They, will use, they want to, exactly, they want to pull you down. But it's they... not emotional. It's money terms, right? For sure. Uh, and I understand that, and that, and I, I think that's uh, what a healthy uh, capitalist society will be will look like. You know, like people will compete to create better products. And for example, you differentiate your product based on value, so you provide high value instead of providing free shots or just free. You know, like you, you know, like a cheap. Yeah, like souvenirs and shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You do provide your value in, in just like in the experience. And I understand that. And I'm completely uh, good with that. What I mean is the government shouldn't be competing against <laughs> or helping. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the, truth is, the truth is they protect their friends. Who is the friend? The people that pays most of the taxes. So sure. normally the large corporations in each industry, they uh, are uh, influencing the decisions made by the institutions that supposed to support our industry. In this case, um, uh, I forgot the institution, the official name, honestly, I don't even remember the letters, but Secretary of Tourism, for example, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, they have these big companies that, that have, have been dominated for the past, I don't know, 20 years or so. So they will control that in, in, in order to make it difficult because who's paying more taxes? These big companies. Mm -hmm. And who's giving more jobs to the people? These big companies, the hotels and all that stuff. So when they see you coming from the bottom, for example, like that, that, that's a good example. You want to get your license as a tour agency. Yeah. Yes, but then you need to go exactly to Hacienda, to the Fisco. Mm -hmm. and there, uh, So you won't avoid taxes. You have to pay the taxes, right? Yeah. Uh, so and then you go to Hacienda and, and in Hacienda they will tell you and you need to do this also mm -hmm. and if this one is not approved or takes longer or takes shorter or whatever you have to align the the planets you know what I mean? you have to align the planets or uh, having a, a, an influence maybe if you have friends inside or corruption you know paying someone inside etc so that's that's when they fight you back but I would say it, 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 it's 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 systemic. I don't think it's the people. I think it's the same system uh, protecting itself. Because remember, what is the, 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 the main function of capitalism is the competition, is, is to compete between each other. So for me as a sociologist, I don't see the individual like fighting me personally and I'm going to tear you down. Honestly, I never got involved in any of that. But you realize for example, that your competitor uh, did a better promotion mm -hmm. or they, they, they're they lowering the prices super low so they will take that market from you. You, yeah. you know what I mean? I think it's, it's part of the structure. I don't think it's the actual people like like uh, being a conspiracy against you and nothing like that. I think it's not sustainable for sure. I, I, I don't think this is, uh, this is an economical and political system that is sustainable. Uh, there's a lot of debt. Mm -hmm. That's the reason is making is making it difficult for all of us, including governments, right? Sure. So, so, so I don't think it's sustainable, and that's the reason we use every strategy uh, again, like in war, to destroy your enemies. So, um, re recently I, I read um, an article that talked about Guadalajara being the the new Mexican Silicon Valley. So what, do, what would you think about that? Or what would you say about that? Do you think uh, Guadalajara is actually the new Mexican uh, Silicon Valley? I don't think so. I think it's promotion of the local government. Uh, it's handwork. It's not Silicon Valley. There are no engineers. There is no technology being developed there. 
they're well, like actually um i have actually seen the there are a lot of um there are a lot of engineering companies actually moving to guadalajara for for some reason and and I but you know the reason cheap labor and good weather for sure siemens yeah, uh, that's the reason yeah siemens is doing is doing uh, operations in guadalajara i think and or maybe maybe somewhere in jalisco maybe not in guadalajara but um I think that's one of the most important semiconductor companies in, in the world. And it is pretty impressive that, that they're doing that. So it's not impressing to me. The reason is there, there uh, many companies will keep doing that is mm -hmm. because communications and strand and transports become easier uh, with time. And also because instead paying 16 or $18 an hour in the United States, they pay 200 pesos a day here for the people that is doing production. So, so me in economical terms, it's very logical for them to look for uh, for poor countries like ours, you know. Yeah. So I'm not impressed by that. Silicon Valley, it's a name uh, to to put it some makeup, but I met the managers. They don't even speak Spanish. They're not uh, Mexicans. They actually book my tours. People involved in these companies, engineers, you know, from India and stuff like that, or from China. And these people live in their countries. They come to check everything is happening. This is the people with the money, the CEOs, the managers. The rest of the people, they're not getting good jobs. That's my opinion, honestly. So like Mexican people are not actually developing um, like IT startups or like internet. There's IT, but I have friends in Paul. I mean, they get 12,000 uh, pesos. I mean, but I know that they get involved. But it's like, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not something that you should pay to an engineer that study five years or so you know my my question was more to, towards uh are, are mexican people the ones uh getting starting these companies like owning the startups or is it like foreigners that come and start the the companies in guadalajara and then they hire local mexicans would you say that mexicans are not the ones then um getting the startups uh running for sure for sure they're not no mm -hmm. because because remember, in telecommunications, we have a big monopoly, Carlos Slim. So you have to fight against him. And the other one it would be the, the, the way the system works. Again, the economical system. These companies are global corporations with huge budget to invest, looking for, yes, great quality of uh, engineers, great quality of labor, but in a cheap price. Mm -hmm. So I would say most of the companies in the technology part, that's what they call the, the Silicon Valley. It's, it's not even compar comparable in size. It's super small, super small. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the truth is the companies that are there are, are not Mexicans, exactly. And uh, in Mexico, uh, remember we have a different currency. So if you want to invest in technologies that is handle it in dollars, mostly US dollars. If you are a Mexican and want to do that, it's almost impossible. If you are international or one of the richest men like Carlos Slim, you can, but otherwise there's no budget to do that. So just because of the currency, man, 20 pesos, $1, you know? Are you kidding me? So we, we earn pesos, we don't earn dollars. So as a Mexican, super difficult to get that amount of money, banks, I think in Mexico, the banks are the worst uh, in all over the world in, in terms of the commissions and, and the benefits that they get also. Also maybe related to, to lobbying, we don't know, but could be, you know, maybe related to corruption because I heard Mexico, in, especially in Mexico, is where you pay highest commissions pretty much for any different uh, thing that you want to do in a bank. So, so at the end, uh, this is the country of opportunities for many, uh, many companies, not only Americans, for many companies, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's my vision because I've seen it, because I, I have met people related. For me, that's, that's my life. That's what I love. Mm -hmm. Since I was very little, I got involved with people from different classes, different social positions. I remember even when I was uh, in, 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 in primary school, is that the name? Primaria? Primary school? Uh, like, uh, elementary. Uh, elementary. Mm -hmm. 
I remember we were in private schools. All my friends were uh, super well off and, and, and rich. And then my dad had uh, the, in the in the ninety four crisis, uh, and after Salinas and all of that, uh, he lost uh, a lot of businesses. And we moved to the public school. So I was hanging out in the neighborhoods with mm -hmm. super poor people. So I got the vision very very small, uh, and 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 it's and it's very simple, man. I mean, at the end, the opportunities that the poor people gets are very limited. Yeah, I think if you become aware of that, you can make it. And yes, many people uh, have made it coming out uh, from the neighborhoods and poor. Well, people, even people having, if you have a, 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 a good taco business, for example, a taqueria, mm -hmm. doing well, doing well, mm -hmm. you live amazing for the rest of your life. You get some employees yeah. and, 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 and you, you make it great. You, you don't have to be. You don't have to be a scientist, right? But you have to be willing to 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 to, to fight back. Yes, for sure. Um, so, like, um, I remember uh, the guys from from the Colonia. You remember uh, the taqueros, the guys that that had their taco shops. And uh, you remember this guy called Lalo, the guy that you that used to have his taco stand near the near the church. Like that guy has been yes. living out of this for like maybe 30 years and he has See? decent money, you know, he seems pretty happy and he has employees, he creates jobs and, and, and overall he's part of the community, right? I mean, he just becomes part of the community. Um, are you still living in, in the Colonia or, or are you moving uh, to a different place? Yes, I'm here at the Colonia, man. I, I moved back because right now we have the conflict with the with the house that, you know, my grandma, uh, grandmother, he passed away. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so I move forward to support uh, my mom right now because it's a legal issue. Legal. Well, at the beginning, there was a conflict. That's the truth. At the beginning, there was a, a conflict. We're talking about the uh, herencias, the, how do you say that in English? Inheritance. Inherit. Yeah. That word is fucking. Inheritance. Yes. So at the end, uh, you know what happens when it comes to money. And, and, and when you have these experiences, then that's when you realize, man, mm -hmm. I'm a humanist. I like to believe we humans, we are uh, amazing. But yeah. at the end, you have to understand that we also have that in, 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 in I mean, I don't even know how, how to put it because it, it's an historical thing, you know, humans... I mean we humans, we have been violent since forever. We we, we treat bad other people. I mean, we can talk about many uh, uh, things related to that. But that's what I mean. For example, uh, here with the problem with the inheritance, what is it? It's money. It's the house, and they fight for it. They don't even have to. But the emotions, they're jealous because they're brothers and sisters, you know, and and they have resentment. Who knows? And no, uh, you don't deserve this. And that's what happened. You know, it's like, it's like, you don't need to. I mean, it's all in the paper. You, you have to you just sell the house and everybody gets their money, split it, and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. But then you see the human's emotions again, the, the human uh, kind. We are like that. We like conflict. We like uh, to do a mess of things. So at the end, that's when you have to realize that people we are like that i mean we we are like this so you just have to understand it and and live with it and that's going to be involved in your businesses emotions will uh, get you and you have to you have to like we say here in mexico right cabeza fria like cold mind you have to make decisions with a cold mind cold brain right yeah, a so cool, a cool a cool mind so like basically keep it keep it cool exactly uh, or take decisions later when 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 you're not uh, un uh, angry anymore, right? When, when when the emotions pass, then you make the decisions and, and you have to think back. Uh, I think one of the main issues, not only in Mexico but in the world, we don't know how to dialogue. We don't know how to interact. Um, it, I'm talking about uh, dialogue. You know that that um, emotions-free interaction reflecting on the real things that you're actually saying or doing, people go through their life normally almost almost unconscious 
of, of what they're doing, right? Like like people like beating their wives and all that stuff. I mean, that stuff that it happens because exactly because you don't reflect before. You just make the hit without thinking. You make that decision without thinking. You know, it's like it's a human condition again. That's my point. I I, I wouldn't blame us. I just said that you have to understand human conditions and then deal with it, right? So, Especially in business. Yeah. Recently, you know, like I'm a very, I myself, I'm kind of like, like, um, like a pleaser. I like to please people, and that's kind of like what what I like to do. But when it comes to business, then it becomes difficult to to then argue or to even um, try to negotiate, right? So one of the things I have been doing to try to remind me that um, humans are animals, and as any other animal, they will try to fuck you up. <laughs> you know, in in business, that's how it how it works, unfortunately. And I have I, I usually try to reach a win win situation, but I think keeping myself understanding that that they will always try to come up on top, or you know, get as much as they can out of a deal. I usually look at um, I'm looking at nature videos like for example lions or even polar bears i mean i have been watching polar bears killing other polar bears just to eat them and that's cannibalism and i, I don't think humans are gonna get into cannibalism but that's just a reminder that we are also uh, fighting for resources and things are gonna get nasty if if all of a sudden someone's um someone's survival needs are are in in play right so that's why I think one of the things that you just mentioned, uh, it's also very relatable to this because you said that people are cruising uh, through life without really thinking in a strategy to get through it, right? And they just go through it and they don't really communicate with others. They just try to get things done as much as possible so that their needs are, are met. But one of, the exactly. reasons, one of the reasons why I think people do that is because if we go back to the to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I don't know if you're if you're familiar with it. Um, yes, 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 I'm familiar with. I, yeah. I I don't. Again, I'm not a determinist. I'm not white or black. I like doubting. I think doubt is one of the greatest weapons and tools that you can use in human life. Uh, don't believe anything. Why? These are possibilities. These are human constructions. Theory is a human construction, but of course you have, again, standards. So yes, I, I do know that pyramid. I think it would be improved also maybe. We evolve with history, right? Yeah, for but, sure. And and I don't think it is a, a determinist, uh, deter I don't wanna give it a determinist approach, but, but briefly we can kind of like generally kind of guide ourselves through it. And it actually has helped me in a way. Uh, hey to understand my community in, in, in some way. Uh, so you were saying? It's true. It is true. I mean, I don't want to, uh, it's, it's not my purpose again to be uh, against you. It, I'm <laughs> not just 100% uh, sure if that's a correct uh, scale of values uh, or, or needs, but at the end, uh, exactly. Uh, I think uh, all subjects, uh, all things are, uh, are able to to be modified or improved, and and that's another thing that sometimes we forget. We, we want to stick with it exactly. We don't like to change. It's a human condition again. Exactly, we have we need basic stuff. We are not that complex. Exactly, I, I would say even you don't need even the, the 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 Maslow theory. I mean, what do we need? We basically survive as humankind. We basically survive. What do you do every day? You eat. You work. We com we com uh, complicated the things that we study. We do complex things. But what do you normally do every day? I mean, you just survive. I mean, you work out maybe. But yeah. and then we have enjoyments. Of course, you have these pleasures and you enjoy, and that's it. And you take a shit, and then and then you sleep. But we are not that complicated. We need basic things, mm -hmm. and we need to maintain them exactly. Uh, you just. You just talk about it. It's not sustainable the way we're we're living right now because we have so many so many commodities, right? Well, the thing is, I think in Mexico the, the main problem and the, the the thing that you are touching on is that people can barely meet their their basic needs. So, like they are, you know, they're working hard to get a, a, a shitty salary, which you already mentioned in the past, 
um, and they they can barely feed their kids. They can barely feed themselves. They can barely pay for rent. So like all of that, all of that creates a very a very difficult situation for people to actually self actualize, or or for what other people will mean is to to bring new knowledge into their heads, or to even you know think about what they want to do with their lives. Because if you ask, uh, if you ask, I mean, I asked one of my uncles once, and when I was a kid, I said, when are they gonna rest? And then. And then my uncle said, "Oh, they're gonna rest when they're when they're dead. Like the the late the, some people that were working in the street. It, right? It's a Mexican phrase, right? Yeah. It's a Mexican phrase. You're gonna rest when you die. I mean, what are you talking about? Yes, yeah, exactly. Like you're, you're, you're you're never resting when you're alive, right? And then these people I, I always see working, right? And and I say, are they taking a vacation or something? No, they're they're gonna rest when they when they die. And and like that's because we cannot really meet our basic standards. And one of the things that I, I think are very important that we really do, do not value so much in Mexico because uh, unfortunately American culture kind of goes into, uh, into our, uh, our media is that education is highly valuable uh, at a ver when we're very young and we don't, we don't really take advantage of it as much as possible. Um, I think we do have a decent uh, education system. The problem is that we don't, we culturally are kind of educated to see it as boring or something that is not gonna really help you um, in the real world. So you always hear, I don't know if, you, if you've heard it, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> it is very common that, oh, you know, he was really good in school, but in real life, he didn't do well. And that, that kind of comments that come from parents, because I heard it from my parents, you know, like they were like, yeah, but like, you know, you may not be as good at, in school, but you may do very well in business. And I think we shouldn't really focus on separating both of them, right? Real life and business um, are the same as school. If you, if you are doing very well in, in business or you are, you have, you're really wealthy after school and you were not really good in, in school, that, that can mean a, a few things. That can mean that probably you had a really good networking uh, skills, so you could create good a, a good network, or maybe your parents had a really good network and that really helped you um, improve and come up on top. Or you're just a genius that really, you know, uh, that really had a different way of learning and you learn on your own and you didn't really need the, the knowledge from school, but that's an outlier. That's Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates. And I, and I feel that the outlier usually, it usually casts a shade on the other two, on the other two uh, main reasons why people succeed after they, uh, after they graduate with shitty, with shitty school marks, right? So like my, my, one of my big, biggest concerns is that education in Mexico is not really valued, valued. And on top of that, it is kind of archaic. Uh, the way we educate people in Mexico, right? So like we sit them in a, in a classroom for eight hours or something, and then just expect them to pay attention to kind of like the most monotonous and boring professors that you can possibly get. And, and, the, and the professors are usually not very uh, passionate as well. But, but again, like it is not too different to how they teach people in Canada. I mean, I've seen it and it, it is pretty similar. And then the, the, the difference between how Canadians um, de developed uh, to actually work in the in the workplace and how Mexicans do is is you know day and night. There, there's a big contrast. So what would you say in terms of like where do you think the education system goes and do you think it will help people um, improve their business kind of skills or just like their their personal life strategy to to be better and to improve the country? Um, well, you touch on many subjects, very complex subjects, and we can make one post podcast for each, bro. <laughs> um, yes, again, for me, as a social sciences guy, uh, reality is it's like a network, exactly. You mentioned like a web uh, of networks, maybe super complex, right? Uh, but yes, there are hierarchies, of course, and there are systems and subsystems maybe connected. That's reality to me. So yes, um, education, where is it going? I don't know, but 
they're doing worse right now with COVID, of course, through TV, yeah. they're teaching, removing the contact from these childs, uh, especially to do the things that they care that is not listening the teacher mostly, especially in elementary, right? Yeah. They like to play. They like, they want to play between each other. That's what the kids want. They want to talk between each other mm -hmm. or they want to run and, and jump and all that stuff, mm -hmm. first of all. Uh, but the way, the reason this is happening, in my opinion, you mentioned it. it's a global system, education. It's almost the same anywhere except Finland or maybe some places that uh, they have been distinguished because of the the different education or the greatest education and all of that. But at the end, uh, the people that has access to those different tools are like, uh, yes, a very small percentage in the world. So normally the standard schools, uh, private or public doesn't matter. They have a, a, a system based on, on competition too, because what is the purpose of the educational system? The purpose is to produce workers for the jobs that the capitalism requires. Those jobs are normally going to be shitty. They don't require CEOs. They don't require owners of the company. They require normally cheap labor. Uh, those are the jobs that the people that is actually rich, they don't want to do. So yeah. who's gonna do it? The poor people, they don't have nothing. So what they need, uh, what what do they have? Their own hands only, your your, your work, your job, yeah. uh, your handwork. So, so th I think that's, uh, in, uh, implicit in the capitalism itself. I think you cannot remove that. Well, who's going to be your waiter if you're, just imagine this, who's going to be your waiter if you're rich? Well, well I, I, if everybody's I, doing well, who's going to be the waiter? No. no one. So you need poor people to sustain the capitalism. That's my, my opinion in, mm -hmm. as a fact. You need it. Yeah, Otherwise, well, who's going to clean the plumbing system if he's rich, who's going to do it? I mean, you need this poverty coming from the slavery, uh, slavery, of course. So today, you don't need the slavery. You just pay them nothing. It's almost the same system. You, they, can barely, they can barely survive. Exactly. They can barely eat. They can barely pay the rent. It's a very similar system. It's just an evolution of history in the world, of course. But the people that is in the small sphere of the elite, Mm -hmm. They preserve the same conditions pretty much since before the slavery was abolished, you know? Yeah. Uh, so so that's a little bit of a, it sounds like conspiracy, but these are historical facts. Normally, the small uh, percentage of the population are the richest, and the rest is the, normally the people that is running these big industries and all that stuff, uh, the, 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 the real workers like us, you know? So yeah. at the yeah. end, uh, uh, going back to your question, the educational uh, system was created to supply the jobs that the capitalism needs. And these jobs are not what the students or us as humans want in life. So mm -hmm. that's the conflict that I find. Obviously, we don't care about those subjects. They have removed in Mexico, they have removed philosophy, they have removed poetry, they have removed uh, even some history lessons, in, depending on, on your studies and depending what type of... Uh, for example, at the university, if you study something that is not related to history, you will not get it. Um, stuff like that. So at the end, uh, in, 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 in the control, in the political control, uh, especially you were, you were talking about uh, patriotism and nationalism, I think they're in crisis. So what is happening right now, because no one else believes the institutions anymore, uh, and, and, and it's very difficult to, con to control us because we have technology to find information out and, 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 and to speak and to show videos and podcasts. So technologies have helped to, to yeah, to, to, to help us to find different things that we were actually interested in. Uh, so at the end, I think uh, that's the reason if you look uh, what's happening right now, well, the COVID is the, is the, the pretext, is the excuse, right? The COVID is an excuse, but you see more control over uh, internet, over uh, the medias, over the population in general, you know. So I think it's part of that because we are uh, thinking different, finally, after generations, uh, like the boomers and that people. So mm -hmm. I think that's part of the, the evolution. In my opinion, that's the reason we have too many conflicts because finally we have spoken 
and we have complained. But uh, it's cyclical. In my opinion, it's cyclical. I mean, we have this problem like global warming and, 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 and pollution and, 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 and destroying the earth and all that stuff. Uh, things forever. Right now, we're seeing the consequences of that. So what's going to happen? Who knows? Education, education is just part of that. We have a crisis in education in Mexico and, and I would say the world, especially thanks to COVID. But uh, it's not designed to, 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 to make the kids joyful. Yes, I would say. That's my experience at school. Man, just, think, just think when you were a kid and you were going to school. I mean, you don't care. You don't care what the teacher is saying. You just want to play with your friends, you know, and 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 be a kid. Uh, so so it's like uh, it's not designed to make the child happy or us as a students uh, to su to supply your needs. Uh, in my opinion, you know, and and if you are aware of that, that's when you decide not going to school because the other part is not going to give me money anyways. You know, it's not anymore at least. Yeah. Uh, so at the end. All of those facts that I just mentioned are involved. That's the reason it's such a long answer. But sure. um, I think you're, you're right. But I think there's one point that, that may, may probably haven't uh, been like one of, the, so one of the main sources of topics in, in Mexico. But I think uh, automation, like labor automation, will, po will possibly um, incentivize schools to start teaching people about engineering and stem uh fields because you know as, as engineering becomes i mean as automation becomes more prevalent um labor regular uh, manual labor and cheap labor is, is going to become obsolete i mean once you have robots doing everything you, uh, a human can do which is not far away actually um people you know there are there are even robots. I hope, I hope I never see that day. I hope so, honestly. It would be very sad for me. It would be very sad. You will see it. It's not. I mean, there are robots already that can. I do hope it. not. <laughs> maybe uh, I, I. Maybe I. I. I, I get in a car, uh, car accident or something, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but there are robots already that are doing a better job than a lot of doctors at looking at um, X-ray and uh, looking at X-rays and analyzing for tumors. And they can they can usually do a much much better job than doctors, and and that's not because doctors are stupid. It's just because these robots have a, a lot more um, a more a lot more processing power than a, a human brain, or even a better way of analyzing data than a human eye. Human eye, sorry. And unfortunately, I mean Mexico is incredibly reliant on on cheap labor, and I agree with you. I mean. You can see a lot of people without a high school having a, re a reasonable life because they can get a job as a driver or something. But when when driver uh, driverless cars come in, I mean that's gonna be something fr from the past. And I I assure you, in ten years, that's gonna be the reality uh, in Mexico and in everywhere in the world. So um, for 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 Mexico, I think to survive, and that's why I was very interested on. Guadalajara being the new Silicon Valley in Mexico, because even though it may not be able to compete with San Francisco, for example, we, I think it, it is important that Mexico uh, provides this these Silicon Valley kind of experience to the rest of Latin America, because um, I don't know if you realize that, but Mexico is kind of the US for the America, for the rest of Latin America. So uh, Mexico provides a lot of the culture to the rest of Latin America. But and what I mean by providing the culture is the Mexico provides telenovelas, uh, uh, El Chavo. Um, they provide a bunch of music. And obviously, it is a sim symbiotic relation. Colombia and Venezuela, they do also provide a lot of culture to the rest of the, con uh, the countries. In Latin America, but Mexico has these these huge media companies like Televisa that broadcast incredible an incredible amount of information from Mexico to the rest of Latin America when we don't really receive that much information from them. And I think it will it will really be useful that for for that section of the world to actually get together and. And, and develop technology of their own because Latin America, Latin America has very different needs to North America. And a lot of the things that we see in North America, 
arrived very late to Latin America. One of the things I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna describe to you at the moment is is this app in English called Grammarly. So since I started university in Vancouver, uh, Grammarly has been basically my best companion. It basically tells me what I'm writing uh, in, with spelling mistakes or if if I have any issues with grammar at all, it fixes it automatically, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I use it. I use. And and if you are in in Mexico, like the equivalent in Spanish is very shitty. I mean, there is an there is a, an app that does it, but it is not nearly as good. And maybe it is because not a lot of uh, Latin Americans are going to university, but there are a lot of universities in Latin America, and there are a lot of professionals in Latin America that do not know how to how to properly write in a business fashion or they don't know how to write academically. And that's a big issue. And I think that that's why I was kind of excited. And I was even considering going back to Mexico to try to, you know, like incentivize uh, these new technologies that I have already seen here. And I would like to have them applied in, in, in Latin America. And these are services that will definitely bring a big, uh, a big impact to, to, to the whole, you know, subcon uh, not subcontinent, the whole continent uh, of like North and South America, because you know, Mexico is part of North America um, and then Central America and also South America. So like, I, I, I do think that there's a lot of potential, but unfortunately, as you say, the system is very shady and there is always gonna be a push for a pushback towards you. Last question I wanna, I wanna get before I deviate from the topic too much is how are you dealing right now with COVID and is your com is your competition uh, still alive? And if so, do you think you can you can leverage this this current situation to uh, take advantage of your of your competition and then come up on top? Because I know you're a small business and your competition is very big, so your competition may have a lot more overhead cost, and they may not be able to sustain it for a long period of time. I mean, at the moment, it's eight months. Yes. Um... It's a good question, man. At the end, um, where do I start? Um, okay. <laughs> the, <laughs> yes, the, the competition here, the competitors uh, are many. Uh, after the pandemic, of course, uh, a few people is, is going out of business, I guess. Um, but there's a bunch of agencies, tour agencies, uh, big ones, medium and, and small, like like I am, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the if you are registered as a formal company with, I think you need five employees at least. I don't remember exactly the, the requirements. Uh, they did uh, get the loans, or I don't know how to call them, credits, loans from the government uh, because of the pandemic. In some point, they will have to pay for them. I, I, I don't know the terms. There was support, the new government, again, it is doing different things. Uh, for example, you mentioned the uh, supporting the people that, uh, that need needs the most. Uh, since the beginning of the new administration, um, the people, uh, what we call adultos mayores, the seniors, right? Or how do you call them? Basically, they, all their uh, elder people. Like. Elder people. They got, uh, just because you are uh, 68 years old or 67, I don't remember the age, mm -hmm. to get that benefit, uh, you get 3,000 pesos monthly. Okay. 3,000 3, 3, pesos monthly is nothing but you don't need to do anything. You just make the application and you get it in, in your bank, right? Yeah, I guess so it's that, nothing, right? <laughs> see, 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 exactly. It's better than nothing. He's doing that since the beginning. He's doing that for students in different uh, levels of education. He's uh, offering scholarships and all of that. Mm -hmm. He's basically money for the books and for the transports, right? For the camiones. Uh, because again, it's like 2,000, 3,000 pesos monthly. But at the end, uh, he's doing that also with businesses. Uh, but when you are registered, obviously you have more obligations and, and, and the, the taxing is different. So mm -hmm. you have an option in Mexico 
to be registered in Hacienda as a person with a, a, how do you say empresarial a, with with business activity. Yeah. If you can put it well, if you can put it that like that, you know, mm. a, a person paint with business business activity or doing this, uh, serve, uh, business services, etc. You know, or or a professionist like a doctor, you will get that uh, that. Uh, how do I say that? Uh, you need to be registered like that. Uh, and then you pay uh, different taxes, right? Uh, so uh, in my case, it's more beneficial. So I'm a person doing business activity. I'm not a business mm -hmm. registered in legal terms. So I don't get access to those benefits because I don't give jobs, for example. You know, uh, I don't have to pay for the nomina, for the payroll. So, so uh, we are not included. Many people that uh, because of the benefits, uh, we are not registered as a business uh, and then uh, we don't get that benefit. So again, we never expected a pandemic. For many years, uh, I got benefits from that, paying mm -hmm. lower taxes. Mm -hmm. So at the end, uh, we have options. You just have to do it. Honestly, it's a Mexican tradition too, what we call the CIDIA, right? Mm -hmm. We are lazy for everything because we know what's going to happen. We know it's going to be their struggle. You just have to be willing and, and take action, basically taking action. If you take action, it's not that difficult to get everything for a business. It's actually very cheap to, because I heard from many business, uh, business businesses in the United States, in California, for example, state of California, super difficult to, to start a restaurant, for example, there or a bar. You know, For and sure. super expensive, super expensive, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Different licenses and all that stuff, you know, even for garbage, they pay uh, fees and all that stuff because you produce a lot of garbage, obviously. So in Mexico, uh, we do have uh, many benefits, you know, at the end because you don't have the budget to keep all the business supervised. Uh, so at the end, it's impossible for them because, uh, because uh, again, economical terms, it costs money. I'm not hiring more employees. You know, I'm not hiring more supervisors to check every business in the city with hundreds of thousands of businesses in the city of Guadalajara. It's impossible. So at the end, uh, at the end, they let it go. So if you have that willingness, if you get obviously your investment, if you get the money and you do the paperwork, you might get your business in a very in a very low cost in a very low cost at, le at least to begin to start so that's how the taco people do does it that's how the corner grocery store does it you know uh, some people they do have heritage they do have the a house so in their house run the business and they live there and they have the the tiendita right and, and, and it's such a hard work, man. Honestly, I would say uh, I had the opportunity to meet people doing many different businesses. I have a friend that, that uh, shut down his tiendita, his grocery store, because of that, because he said, man, I spent 12 years or so work, uh, uh, waking up at 5, 6 a.m., going to bed 10, 11 p.m. You know, it's like, like Monday to Sunday, like no rest. It's my tiendita, it's my business, right? I have to be there every day because in the culture, it's just like that. Uh, very difficult to trust other people. Uh, you don't know about uh, recruiting people because that's not available. You have to uh, find out yourself. So at the end, you have a bunch of problems to start a business, a bunch of problems. The reason I, I dedicated to tourism is because I don't need a, a physical location, at least in my case. Everything is done by uh, WhatsApp or, or internet, right? Or, or social networks. So I don't want to pay for a business, uh, a rent for a business. I don't want to pay for it. Too risky, right? So I don't need it. My office is my house. Um, and that, and that I don't need employees because we work freelance, all, all of the tour guides involved, including my partner. So the structure is more like, uh, first of all, again, uh, this is not our primary job, all of us, honestly. Uh, 
uh, for survival because it's a startup, but we don't have enough money to pay for our living. So all of us, we do other jobs. So uh, this is a freelancing job. So we know that in the high season, we'll get plenty tours. And then we know that the low season for a month or two, there's no jobs. Uh, because we work with high-end activities. That's part of what you have to know. Not many people have the money to pay for your tour. So, uh, Fernando, I know that you invested a lot of money into revamping the website, right? Like you, I mean, um, I was helping you with that. And I remember at least, I don't know if you continue working with Vleco, uh, this company. Yes. But, um, so you, you invested at least... Uh, how much was the, the price that they that they gave you for for the whole new revamp? At the end, uh, at the end, ten thousand pesos. So like about five about five hundred US dollars, right? Three. Si. Yeah. Okay. So like it wasn't that much compared for uh, compared uh, if you compare this with a physical business, it's nothing. Yeah, for sure, it's nothing. And then that in, and it is your only real estate. Will you? Would you say that you have recovered your investment since then? I know that you probably finished this website by the end or by the beginning of the pandemic. So uh, have you been able to recover your investment or do you think uh, it will take uh, a couple of years for that to happen? No, man, the pandemic destroyed me. And I blame the pandemic. Yes, <laughs> I was hoping to be a great year. Yeah, I was hoping to be a great year at the beginning. You have to reflect on that. Uh, people, I guess people, for sure, they get anxiety, stress, they get mad, they they beat their wives, they drink, whatever. After the after three months of the pandemic, have you realized this is gonna take a while? You just have to accept it, uh, doing your best, and 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 that's it. Surviving mode, surviving mode started since the pandemic. So I have not recovered that investment. I hope to recover it. I hope so. I but, mean, I'm being positive about it. Not this year, maybe the next year. But but it wasn't a huge investment. Again, 500 US. Uh, you want you want a, a taco car made of a stainless steel, 50,000 pesos, bro. You know? Yeah. So you, um, you're... I mean, I have seen your social media and you still post uh, about your tours. And I have actually been talking to you the past couple of weeks and you, you go for tours every, every Saturday or something, right? So I'm assuming you're it's still- It's becoming better. It's been a, a while without tours, like, like months, mm. two or three months. Uh, and then one and then two and then another uh, day, uh, a, a week or so without it. Um, see, sadly, uh, because uh, I'm self-employed pretty much, so I do it myself. But the other people that I normally hire, uh, they're not getting tours. The other people, my, my mm -hmm. colleague, for example, and, and, and other people, at least from my platform, they're not getting jobs because there's not many. So I do it. So again, it's, it's, it's survival mode. Uh, but I do have a few, and for me, it's great, of course, because I I, 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 I did my website and, I, and I, I created my platform through the social networks and, and there is people contact me, there is people booking on TripAdvisor on, on Airbnb. Uh, so so at the end, uh, thanks to that, I can survive, but uh, I'm not becoming rich for sure and, and having a lot of money soon because uh, the, the year was broken by the pandemic. Yes. So how, how how is your, your business model kind of working? So do you, um, so obviously you charge a fee for like per person, right? Or per tour. Um, but mm -hmm. do you, do you also see a big benefit coming from, from tips from customers? Uh, do you, do you think uh, tipping is one of the main sources of income or is it just like a, a, a minor added uh, income to, to your operation? I don't focus on tips. I don't focus on tips because I know the human mind. Uh, I, 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 I believe that I know a little bit of, of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have studied psychology and, and, and sociology, so I, I understand uh, how people normally behave. And every human is different. That's our nature. It's very subjective. So I don't want to leave my incomes to subjective decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So I like a standard price. And then what is gonna happen as a consequence, I do normally get tips. But again, my niche is, is people that is earning well money. We're talking about towards a hundred US per person or, or above that. Mm -hmm. For example, the, the Tapalpa tour, uh, the Tapalpa tour, it's all inclusive. Uh, and you're all day visiting all the spots with a local expert, food included, drinks, alcoholic drinks, you know, tequila and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's more like, like, like uh, having fun all day, don't worry about anything. And, and all the time you have a, a local expert with you explaining everything. So that's my vision for my tours for sure. and all of them are like that. Uh, but I focus on that niche, you know, uh, these people, they, they do, I, we had people, for example, from Facebook company, uh, I, I don't know which positions, but I, I, I assume they were important because they had their own security staff, mm -hmm. like three like, like three black suburbans with oh, security oh. staff. So what, so company, what company were they working for? Facebook company. Really? They were working for Facebook? Facebook company. Holy fuck. That's good, man. Visiting Guadalajara. Uh, that was the people from, from Silicon Valley, I guess. That was the people. And they were visiting. Did they tell you kind of like uh, what they were doing in Guadalajara or it was just vacation? I, I couldn't ask because the security staff was so over. Very tight security. Really? Like, like 10 persons, like 10 persons in, in, in following us in the suburbans all day. Do you think that hindered kind Being of... Like, with us and, and all that stuff. Okay, so do you think that hindered the quality of the, of the trip maybe for, for the customer? Yes, we have to adapt. That, that's, that's my goal. That's my focus, personalized service. I don't care. But yes, because these guys don't trust you. They're fucking Chilangos from security companies that drives rich people in, in Mexico City, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. So these guys don't trust you, even to get close to, to, to the guy in charge because they had a security guy from the United States and this guy hired the Mexican company here to, to be with them. So, um, so very, very, very rare, very, very weird, honestly, in my opinion, but as a, as a businessman, I have to adapt to my customer desire, you know? So how, how did they hear from you or how did they dis decided to go with you? I think on TripAdvisor and they wanted something private for 30 people, 30 persons. 30 people. Oh, okay. And oh. they wanted private tours. I do private tours. Not many people is doing private tours. Again, I have to take the opportunity. So, so because it, I mean, it doesn't work it, but because yes, these guys, they charge low cost. So. So for them, they want to get the buses full, like with 50 persons on a bus or two or three buses in a, I mean, and you and you collect, I don't know, $20 of each of them or $40. I don't know how much they charge. They charge, they charge really low, you know, these big corporations doing tours. So at the end, uh, it's very difficult to find it. And even if you want to make, for example, if you just made the call to the agency, mm -hmm. most of the time, they don't even speak English most of the time, mm -hmm. you know? So, so um do, do you bring them in a bus or how do you bring 30 people uh, two vans two two white vans two white vans and is it like so you already have developed a dynamic basically like do, when, when they go into the vans you you have like a like some sort of gains or something to get them in, to get them kind of started or is it just like uh get into the van talk to each other and then go to the destination how does that work it's very simple i keep it simple man um uh, at the end uh, one 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 guide for each pan for each pan mm -hmm. one guide uh and the guy if we need to the guy is driving or the guy is driving is uh the co-pilot and and then there's co-pilot the co-pilot the two persons in each one two staff members in each uh, van okay one driver one uh, one is a local host uh, and the local host is going to be uh, answering all the questions and all it's going to give you a quick uh, piece of information about, okay, right now we're driving to Tequila. It's going to be a one hour drive. Anything you need, please let us know. I'm at your service. That's it. Simple. You know, nothing fancy. The tour is going to do the job for you when you, when you are there, when you do, where you do your thing. Okay. You have, you have to do it great. But for me, transportation is, transportation is just checking with the places. Okay. Which place is open now? 
okay, what what uh, you you read the people? I say I read the people. You read the people, okay? What kind of food they would like? They're taking a lot of selfies, okay? Maybe this restaurant is going to be good for them because of the selfies. You have to read the customer. Everyone is different, man. Mm. Okay, perfect. That's really good, man. And I, I mean, I'm really good. That, I'm really happy to hear that you're good and that your business, even though probably at the moment it's slow, um, still getting customers and you, and it is surviving. Um, I'm also really happy to know that you are um, uh, still on on route to to you know like uh, get your pension or I don't know if that's a pension, but you know retire at 45. Um, I hope that you can do that and. It looks like hopefully, you- man. Hopefully, <laughs> it looks like you have a plan. So I'm happy to hear that, and and definitely it's good that that I, to know that you're again in the colonia with your mom and your brother. So hope uh, hope everything goes well with that. I know I know your entire family or most of them at least, and I know that uh, everything everything will come uh, will come together. And at the end of the day. This should really shouldn't take a big deal for for you guys. Uh, you have always been very united, and uh, I think this this will be like just a sour a sour passage in the history of your family, but not not a very long one. Um, so, Thank you for the, for the words. Thank you for your support. No, for sure. I mean, for me, you guys are kind of my family too, right? Uh, not formal family, but you're kind of my family. I really appreciate it. I, I really appreciate all of you uh, with uh, with all my heart. So. Uh, that's all I can say, and just send a good. Likewise, vibe. likewise. To all of you, uh, I mean, to to you, I used to call you primo, which is cousin uh, for a long time, right? And uh, yeah, it's we're cousins, we're cousins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is good to catch up, man. And uh, thank you so much for giving us all your insight. I know that um, in Mexico, the pre- you know, the free speech is just kind of like limited actually uh, you cannot really say a lot of stuff and i'm glad that you that you managed to come on and and give your honest opinion about many many topics oh, listen i mean at the end uh, not many people ask honestly about these uh, subjects very interesting honestly uh, it was a pleasure to me all right man um well i'm gonna end the recording now so to all the listeners thank you for coming on uh, please, if you ever go to Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, contact Fernando. He'll be your, your guide. And he has amazing tours for all budgets. And yeah, uh, he will give you the best history lessons that you can possibly get in Guadalajara's downtown and also the surroundings, right? Tequila, where do you go? Tequila, Tapalpa, where else? We work, honestly, we work all the state. We have Tapalpa, Tequila, Chapala Lake area. We have uh, Manzanilla de la Paz, Arandas. Uh, Teuchitlan, where the archaeological site is. I mean, we have a bunch of stuff, man. Uh, tastings of tequila, mezcal, craft beer. So yes, feel free to contact us. Uh, we focus again on uh, personalized, unique experiences. It's mm-hmm. not the mainstream stuff, but yes, you're going to be all day with a local expert. What can I say? That's awesome, man. And again, thanks for your time. Have a great day. And all of you, the listeners, yeah, have a great day too. Keep, keep- uh, Yeah, have a good day, bro. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.